Hi everyone, we're going to talk today about chapter two, research methods. We're going to describe how psychologists use the scientific method, distinguish between a random sample and a representative sample. We're going to recognize several forms of descriptive research, we're going to describe the correlational method and identify its limitations, explain how the experimental method can establish cause and effect, explain why reliability and validity are important, define and give examples of descriptive statistics, define and give examples of inferential statistics, demonstrate an understanding of research ethics. So we're going to start out talking about twin studies. So twin studies occur through the Minneapolis or the Minnesota twin studies. And the Minnesota twin studies actually follow every single twin who is ever born if they participate. And it will follow them from birth till death. And the purpose of twin studies is to determine whether traits are from nature, so our genes and hereditary factors, or if it's from nurture, our environmental factors. The prevailing theory these days is something called nature via nurture. So we have some genetic predisposition, our nature, and then it gets kicked into gear because of nurture, something that happens. So an example of this is the addiction gene. So people can be born with the addiction gene, that's their genetic predisposition, and they can go all their lives without that gene ever becoming active. But then something can happen, so some form of trauma that kicks that into gear, that nurture or that environmental variable. We look at twin studies, and what it does is it looks at identical and fraternal twins who are reared apart. So if they're raised by different people and they end up having the same trait, then that trait is said to be nature. It's something that occurs, something that they're born with. If they're reared apart and they have a different trait, then it's said to be nurture, something that occurred because of their environment. And the nature via nurture, as I said, which is the prevailing theory, is going to be mentioned multiple times throughout the semester. It's very similar to a, another theory called the diathesis stress model. And we'll talk about that when we talk about uh, psychological disorders. So let's talk about the scientific method. And I know you're thinking, oh, we've talked about the scientific method every single year since I was in like third grade. But in order to understand how research is done, we have to talk about the scientific method. The scientific method is just a process that's used to conduct research that includes exploration, critical thinking, and systematic observation. So the first step is to develop a question. So I'm going to talk about selective mutism. That's something that I'm really interested in. So my question might be, what causes selective mutism? Next, I'm going to develop a hypothesis. A hypothesis is just a statement that can be used as a prediction. So my hypothesis might be that in early childhood, children who develop selective mutism were chastised for some type of talking or some type of social interaction. Many hypotheses develop into theories, and a theory is something that just explains a phenomenon. It's when you have a well-established body of principles that rest on scientific evidence. So if I do this research and I find that yes, they did have some negative social interaction when they were younger, and 25 other researchers also found that there was some negative interaction when they were younger, then that could become a theory. 
Step three is design the study and collect data. So I have to determine which type of experiment is suitable for what I want to find out. I have to carry out the experiment and collect data. So I'm going to say that for mine, I'm going to do a qualitative study and I'm going to do an interview with the parents. And then I'm also going to have the parents do an interview with their child. When you do a design study and collect data, you have to operationally define the variables. And this is where you just say what the variables are, how they're going to be measured. And it has to be stated in objective observable terms. Step four, we're going to analyze the data. There's two types of statistics that we're going to use to draw conclusions about the data. Descriptive statistics and inferential statistics. Descriptive statistics is kind of exactly what it sounds like. We're going to organize and present the data in tables, graphs, charts. So all of the, the presentation that I have is going to describe the statistics. And then we have inferential statistics. This is where we make inferences and determine probability of events occurring again. And as I said, inferential statistics, you could use SPSS, which is the computer program. And then we're going to publish the findings. We're going to write an article, submit it to a scholarly peer-reviewed journal. So what that means is that all of my peers who are in the field are going to review the, the findings. They're going to determine whether or not the study design that I have is valid and whether or not my results are good. And then replication. So replication is carrying out the same study and getting the same results. And replication is kind of the key in showing that you did a well-designed study. And there's two good examples of replication. The first is the autism MMR vaccine link. So we have heard that autism causes, or MMR vaccine, the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine causes autism. And what this occurred is because of this man who did some research in England. And he found that there was a link between this vaccine and autism. And then what people did was they tried to replicate and get the same results that he did. And they were not able to do so. So once they weren't able to do so, then they started going and looking specifically at his design study, and they found all the flaws with his study. So they found that um, his design study was not valid because it actually wasn't approved by the university. He drew blood at his kid's birthday party. He had uh, a conflict of interest, and he had a financial conflict of interest because he was trying to make his own separate measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine. And the second example is that you cannot transplant the skin of a black rat onto a white rat and vice versa. People have been trying. And then all of a sudden, somebody was able to transplant the skin of a black rat onto a white rat. So again, people wanted to replicate that study because it's something that they've been trying and couldn't do. So eventually they found out that this person actually transplanted the skin of a white rat onto the skin of a white rat and then they just sharpied it black. Once people weren't able to find this or replicate it, they realized that something was wrong and that's when they found out that he did that. So when we design a study, we have to take into account our population sample. So our population is the whole group. It's the group from whom we want to gather data. So if I was doing my design study on children who have selective mutism, so my population would be every child who has selective mutism in the United States. My sample, my part of the whole, might be children who have selective mutism in the state of Michigan. 
but there is something called sample bias. And this is when participants chosen are chosen even though they don't represent the population from which they're drawn. So if I have children in my population who range from age four to age, excuse me, age 12, for the most part, that's who makes up my population. But my sample is made up of only people aged 14 to 16. That's sample bias. My sample does not reflect my actual population. So what we have to do is we have to randomly sample. We have to give each person who has selected mutism, in this case, an equal chance of being selective for our research study. And we have to have a representative sample. So the subgroup of my sample should match the population in terms of character traits. So if I have my population that's made up of mostly young boys aged four to six, then my sample should be made up mostly of young boys aged four to six. And a stratified sample is when my sample is represented proportionally. So for example, if I had out of my entire population of students with selected mutism. If I had 20% who were from age 4 to 6, 60% who are age 6 to 8, and 20% who are aged 8 to 10, then in my sample, my smaller group, I should also have 20% who are aged 4 to 6, 60% who are aged 8 to 10, and then 20% who are aged 10 to 12. I think that's what I said the first time. But we do have something called participant bias, and this is when participants introduce bias into their experiment. People lie and deceive, and they do that for one or two reasons. One, it might be because they want to make themselves look better, or two, they may want to lie so they give results that they think the researcher wants to hear. No matter what the reason is, it negatively affects the ability to sample randomly. So let's talk about descriptive research. Descriptive research systematically observes and records behavior and mental processes without manipulating variables. Because we do not manipulate variables, we can cannot establish a cause and effect relationship. And there's a couple of different types of, nat of descriptive research. The first is naturalistic. This is where you systematically observe and record observations in a natural setting without interfering with the subjects. So this would be like Jane Goodall and Diane Fossey and their works that they've done with primates, where they just watch and they're not trying to change anything. However, it does have some negatives. One is that it is difficult to replicate because you're not going to be able to see the same thing occur naturally twice oftentimes. And unwanted variables get in the way. So those things that we're not predicting are going to affect our study may affect our study. And there's two other main types of drawbacks. One is observer bias. So as an observer, if I'm the one who's recording behavior, I'm going to insert my values, beliefs, expectations, and attitudes. It's just natural. That's what people do. And the other is the Hawthorne effect. People change their behavior when they know that they're being watched. So I have a lot of kids who have frequent behaviors on my caseload at school. And I'll have a teacher email me and say, so-and-so is doing this. Can you come in and watch and give me some suggestions on how to deal with that? So I go in and I watch. And because I'm there, and because my kid knows that I'm probably watching them, they are complete angel. So what I have to do is I have to send in somebody else, one of my colleagues in the special ed department, to go and observe and take good notes. So then that way, 
that child doesn't think that they're being watched if it's somebody who's not their case or teacher. A case study is an in-depth study of just one person. They use multiple methods like surveys, interviews, and observation. This is good for studying rare events. However, you cannot test hypothesis or make generalizations because it's often based off of just one person. So one of the most famous case studies is called the Forbidden Experiment. It's about the wild boy of Avion. And this is really our first look at a feral child. So he walked out of a village in Avion, France. He was captured by the townspeople. And then he was sent to a series of homes, schools, asylums, trying to teach him to be civilized. So here's your Easter egg for this one, is you're going to email me the name of the wild boy of Avion. What did they end up calling him? And then give me two fun facts that you learned about him. Surveys and interviews are when you question a large sample of people and people self-report their behaviors, opinions, and attitudes. So there's some positives that allows a greater collection of data and it does so cheaply and quickly but it also has some drawbacks. Not all people are honest. Many people want to portray themselves in a positive light, so they may lie. The wording of questions may lead to bias. It doesn't give an in-depth answer and explanation for why people answered the way that they do. So sometimes instead of using a yes, no, or open-ended question where people don't necessarily give a good answer, they use a Likert scale. So they might say one, strongly disagree, two, disagree, three, neutral, four, agree, five, strongly agree, or five, like frequently, four, rarely, three, sometimes, never, that sort of thing. An archival study is just a study of previous records. So you go and you look at, for example, um, if you have a student who has a behavior issue, you might go and you might look at all of their school records and see what each teacher has said. That's an archival study. So overall, some of the observation or some of the advantages, sorry, is it allows description and observation of natural behaviors and it minimizes any fakeness. So, for example, if you were looking to see the way that children interact naturally when it's playtime, you would go and you would study them on a playground. Don't do that. People are going to think that you're creepy. You would get very different results if you brought a bunch of kids into a lab and watched them play together. It does allow for easy data collection. Some of the disadvantages is we have no control over other variables and biases. And because we're not manipulating the variable, we can identify, cannot identify cause-effect relationship. The next type is correlational research. The definition of correlational research is a statistical analysis of the relationship between two variables. Correlational research is measured as a correlation coefficient. And this is a number from positive one to negative one that shows the strength or the relationship of two variables. So the closer it is to either negative one or positive one, it means that those two variables are related. If it's zero, it means that they're not related at all. So if we look down at the bottom, so we have a positive correlation. So as one variable increases, the other variable increases. We have a negative correlation, so if one variable increases, the other decreases, or as one decreases, the other increases. And then we have no correlation. So the purpose of correlational research is to identify the strength and the direction of relationships and to predict. The advantage is that it can clarify the relationship between variables, but some disadvantage is again, we don't have any control over variables, so we cannot identify cause effect relationship. And this one, if you ever study statistics, you're going to hear over and over again. Causation does not, or correlation does not mean causation. 
So just because two things are related or occur at the same time does not mean that one causes the other. So if I happen to take an exam and I'm wearing an orange shirt and I get an A, that does not mean that wearing the orange shirt has caused me to get that A. They're just related for some reason. There's two other problems. The, the first one is the third variable problem. So something else that we are not studying has caused the relationship. So if I'm studying the link between violent media, such as video games, movies, and violence, then I might say that those are linked, which they are. There's a correlation between those two. But there might be a third variable, such as abusive parents, that causes that violent video game to cause violent behavior, something that I haven't taken into consideration. And then we have illusory correlations. And this is a fake relationship that people think that's there, but it doesn't really exist. So we've all heard if you're taking a test and you don't know what the answer, you choose C, because that's more likely going to be the answer. That's not true. That's a fake relationship. It doesn't actually exist. computer's not wanting to work. So the experimental method is kind of the, the gold standard of what we want in research design. Experimental method definition is the manipulation and control of variables to uncover that cause effect relationship. And that's the purpose to uncover cause and effect relationship. So when we have an experimental method, we have a random assignment. So we have random assignment. We're going to give everybody an equal chance of participating in the study. But in that random assignment, we want to match as many variables as we can for people. So let's say that I'm going to do a study on a cancer drug called Cure It, and I'm going to have 100 people in my study. I want those 100 people to match on as many variables as they can. So that could be gender, that could be age, type of cancer, date of diagnosis, size of tumor. Those are all things that we want to match the individuals on as much as possible. In an experimental method, we have an experimental group. So that's the person who's going to get my cancer drug, the cure it. It's the group that we manipulate. And then we have a control group. This is the control group that doesn't have anything done to it. So the advantages are that because we control the variables, we can provide an explanation for behavior. We can identify that cause-effect relationship. Some disadvantages are ethical concerns, so we have to make sure that our research is ethical and it's not harming anybody. It can be very artificial if it's taking place in a lab. There's biases that are introduced by both the participants and their researchers. And there's uncontrolled variables, so there are things that we cannot necessarily control. So our experimental research design has six steps. It's very similar to the scientific method. So step one is identifying a hypothesis. So I'm going to say that my chemo drug cure it, in addition to the standard chemo regimen, is more effective. In step two, I'm going to have a selection of research participants through random assignment. So I'm going to get a list of 100 people who are diagnosed um, and are just about to start chemo. Step three, I'm going to determine who goes in the experimental group and control group. Again, this is going to be randomly assigned. So I might take their names, assign them a number, and then I'm going to pull their numbers out of a hat. Step four, both groups participate in the experiment. So they both go to their scheduled chemo. My experimental group is going to get cure it in addition to regular chemo. My control group is just going to get the regular chemo. And step five is I'm going to analyze. I have to determine if it worked. So for my analysis, I might look at a CAT scan or a PET scan and see if there's tumor shrinkage. So did the people who have the cure it, did their tumor shrink more than everybody who just got the regular standard chemo? 
And then step six is I'm going to publish my reports. And there's many safeguards that we have for experiments to make sure that our results are actually valid and reliable. So variables are those measurable characteristics that change over time. It's what gets manipulated. So we have two main, three main variables. The first are independent variables. Independent variable is what is changed or manipulated. Our dependent variable is what is being measured. The results of the dependent variable depend on what happens to the independent variable. And then we have control variables. All these things that we hold constant that we don't change in an experiment. So if I wanted to study whether two hours of sunlight or three hours of sunlight make a plant grow better, my independent variable is going to be the amount of sunlight that the plant receives. My dependent variable, how I'm going to measure whether or not my hypothesis is correct, is going to be the height of the plant. And then my control variable are all of those things that I'm going to hold constant. So the type of plant, the type of plot, the type of soil, the amount of water it gets, the location for the sun. All of those are going to remain constant. The only thing I'm going to change is the amount of sunlight it gets per day. And sometimes we have extraneous variables. And an extraneous variable is some characteristic event or participant that could affect the outcome of the study. So for example, if we're looking at standardized test scores and we're studying um, how studying methods affect scores, if somebody didn't sleep well, that's an extraneous variable. It could affect the way that they perform. If somebody got into a fight with their mom in that morning, that's an extraneous variable. It's gonna affect the way that they perform. And then we have a placebo. And a placebo is just something that is fake. So in my curate, they might have an extra bag of my curate, and then they'll have a placebo for the control group, which is just going to be an extra bag of saline solution. But placebos do cause the placebo effect. And this is where participants have a change because they think that they're getting the treatment. So they might start to feel better or they might start to think that their tumor has shrunk because they don't have symptoms anymore just because they think they're getting the treatment even though they don't. And there's one of two ways we can set up a study and that's blind and double blind. So a blind study is where the research participants don't know what group they're in. So they don't know if they're getting the experimental drug or if they're not. And a double-blind study is the gold standard in research. That's where both the researchers and the participants don't know who belongs to which group. And they use a double-blind study because it gets rid of both participant buyer bias and researcher bias or experimenter bias. And that experimenter bias is bias that occurs because a researcher has influenced the results. So they may, for example, uh, decide that some people are going to get the research drug because they might have a better prognosis than other people. And on the right hand side is a little mnemonic device if you have trouble remembering independent and dependent variable. So the dry is for the dependent variable. It's the responding variable. It's always graphed on the y-axis. And the mix is for the independent variable. It's what's manipulated, it's the independent variable, and it's always graphed on the x-axis. And we have to talk about reliability and validity when we're talking about research. Reliability is the consistency or stability of a test. And this means that a test produces similar scores each time that it's used. And there's three ways that we test reliability. The first is test retest. So I'm gonna take a test and let's say I got an 85% on it. And then I'm gonna take the test again. If it's reliable, I should get around an 85% on the next test. 
The next is interrelator. And this is where you have people who score something, so it's not just a multiple choice. And all the people who score it should have around the same score. So if we think back to like the SAT essay, so you get a score, you have three people who score the essay. If it has interrelated reliability, it means that all three people give you about the same score. And then we have split half reliability. And this is where you split the test in half and each of your questions are kind of matched and your performance on one half of the test should be about the same score as your performance on the other half of the test. And then we have validity. Validity is a measure of how accurate a test is. And what that means is that a test is supposed to be testing what it is. So if I'm taking an IQ test, then that test should actually measure my IQ, not my achievement, for example. And again, there's three different types of validity. These are a little bit more difficult to understand. Internal validity is when it, the design allows it to measure what it intends. So it eliminates alternative explanations other than the cause effect that is established. External validity is how generalizable it is to other settings. So if what you found for home also can apply to what you find in school or the workplace setting. And then we have criterion related. And this is that the accuracy in test scores can be used to predict another variable of interest. So for example, this is measured as a correlation coefficient. So if I have an IQ test, for example, and there's a whole bunch of different IQ tests. So if I'm given the WISC and I score a 90 as my IQ on the WISC, that should predict that I'm gonna get about the same performance on a test that is very similar to it. So the Woodcock-Johnson, for example. So my score on the WISC should predict what my score on the Woodcock-Johnson is going to be. So if we look at our visual here, so the first one all the way to the left, you can see it's reliable, not valid. So all the scores are about the same, but it's not hitting the bullseye. Low reliability and low validity. So they're somewhat clustered. So they're possibly getting the same score and it's kind of sort of around the target. Not reliable, not valid, so they're not clustered at all and they're not anywhere near the target. And then both reliable and valid, the test scores are all clustered and they're clustered right around the bullseye. So it's measuring what it's supposed to be and you're getting the same results each time. Statistics is just a way of collecting, organizing, analyzing, displaying, and interpreting data. And it's done through math. So if you ever take a statistics course, you're going to learn how to actually do the statistics by hand. Then you'll learn how to do them either in a calculator or on a computer. And the math involved in statistics isn't too difficult. The key in statistics is knowing when you use each type of test. And as I said earlier, there's two different types of statistics. The first is descriptive statistics. Descriptive statistics present data through the use of charts, graphs, tables. So it describes the data and it gives a snapshot of it. So often one of the ways that we describe data is through what we call the normal curve or the bell curve, which is the picture that you see. One way that we describe statistics is the measures of central tendency. So the mean, which is the average. So I take all of the scores on a test 
I add them up and then I divide them by the number of scores that I have and that's going to give me the mean. So in statistics you can see the mean is that little fancy letter U, it's called mu. So in your normal data, your normal curve, the average is 100. Your median is the middle number. So if you take all of your scores and you arrange them in numerical order, 50% of your scores should fall below the mean and 50% of your scores should fall above the mean. So in the normal curve, your mean is the same thing as your median. It's both 100. So 50% of your scores fall below 100 and 50% 50 50 of your scores fall above 100. And then we have the mode. The mode is the most frequent number of your data. So all you do is when you line it up to find the median, you just find which number occurs the most frequently. We also have measures of variation. And these are numbers that describe the variation or the dispersion of the data. So across that normal curve from zero to whatever it goes to, how dispersed is my data? The first measure is the range. And the range is the length of the data set. So smallest to highest. And you find the range by subtracting the smallest from the highest. So let's say that my um, highest IQ is 146 and my lowest is 36. Then my range would be 110. Standard deviation is how much the average of each number deviates from the mean. So if we look, our standard deviation on this normal curve is 15. So if we look, 34% of the population falls within one standard deviation on either side. 13.5% of the population falls within two standard deviations and 2.28 falls within three standard deviations of the mean. So if we have low dispersion, that means that our standard deviation is very close to the mean. So it might not be very great. Our standard deviation might be like two or three. If we have high dispersion, it means that our standard deviation is far from the mean. It might be like 30 or 40. So in your normal curve or your bell curve, your standard deviation is 15. And as you can see, 68% of the population falls within one standard deviation, 95 falls within two, and 99 falls within three standard deviations. And we also have measures of position. And this is where data falls in relation to other data. And this is often used as percentile. So a percentile is just the percent that you fall above or below the mean. So if you score in the 73rd percentile, then that means that you did better than 73% of people, but 27% of people did better than you. Inferential statistics, on the other hand, is an analysis of data that determines the probability of events. It generalizes the findings and it tests hypothesis through statistical methods. Hypothesis testing is when statistics are used to determine if the data supports or rejects a hypothesis. So in statistics, often you don't test the hypothesis. That's not what you're trying to prove. You're trying to disprove the null hypothesis. So if we go back to my study on kids with selective mutism, so I might say that selective mutism is caused by some type of negative interaction in childhood. That's going to be my hypothesis. My null hypothesis is that it's going to be that it was caused by some positive interaction. And I'm trying to disprove that null hypothesis. And they do this through statistical significance. 
and statistical significance is a confidence percent. It's usually 95%. That's where this meme comes from. Your confidence interval must be less than 0.05 because 95 minus 5 gives you 5%. You then calculate the probability that the findings were due to chance instead of your uh, test. So we want to be sure that we have 95% confidence that our results are because of our experiment and not because of chance. The larger the sample size, the easier it is to get your statistical significance. However, if you have a small sample size, then you won't be able to get statistical significance as easily, and that's gonna be a drawback. So what happens is there's another program where you punch in everything that you want to do to design your study, and then it tells you how many people you need in that study. If you're not able to match that study size, then after you carry out all of your research and you publish your reports, one of the things that you have to put is that a limitation of your study is that it may not be statistically significant because you don't have the sample size to prove that. A meta-analysis is when you combine findings from multiple research studies on a single topic. So I'm going to find all of the research I can on the causes of selective mutism, and then I'm going to try to find some common um, variables or some common results that will try to prove my hypothesis. It allows researchers to view all data outcomes and make conclusions. So if everybody is showing that yes, it's caused by some type of anxiety provoking interaction where they were chastised for their verbal interaction, then we can probably guess that that is the cause. The research must be ethical. So we have professional organizations such as the American Psychological Association that makes ethical research guidelines. And they do this through an IRB board, which is an institutional review board. So any type of organization that does research, hospitals, universities, like the National Institute of Health, any private organization as well, has to have an institutional review board. And what you do is you present your research to them. So you're going to tell them what your research design is, who your participants are, why you're doing the research, what you think the results are going to be, what the benefits and risks could be, if you have any conflict of interest, if you have any financial conflict of interest, if anybody associated with a study has any type of financial conflict of interest. And then they tell you whether or not you can do it. They'll then tell you what type of informed consent you have to give. And in informed consent is an agreement between participants before they start the experiment. This tells them what the research is about, what to expect, what the benefits could be, what the side effects are. So right there's two problems with the MMR uh, autism study that I mentioned earlier. He actually did not have it passed by the Institutional Review Board from his university. He just went and did the study and he didn't give informed consent. He actually took blood samples from kids at his kid's birthday party. We have to show that participation is voluntary. They're free to do the study or not do the study. And if they choose to do the study, they can walk away at any time. We have to have restricted use of deception and debriefing. So IRB typically will not approve research if you are lying or deceiving the subjects at all. The only time that they'll approve it is when the participants may not react truthfully if they know the real intent of the study, so they use some deception. It's allowed only when necessary and participants must be debriefed afterwards. And what that means is they have to be given a full explanation of the research and explain why and how they used deception. And we're going to watch 
a couple of videos later that show some deception. And then confidentiality. So all identifying information has to be taken away and there can be no way to link the specific results to a specific participant. So if I'm doing that study on selective mutism and I have, let's say, 10 participants that I'm really going to talk about in my study, I can't use anything that's going to link them. So I can't mention their names, their initials, their birth dates, their school, anything that can be linked back to them. So you'll often read that it's very general. So you'll say the study was conducted in a large Midwest town. They won't give you anything specific where you can identify who those participants are. We do have to respect the rights of non-human animals. Seven to eight percent of research is done with animals. Some people think that it's very cruel and it can be, but some research is necessary because it allows people to do research that's unethical to do with humans. So for example, a lot of drug studies start with animals. So if we want to find out whether or not a drug is safe, we're not going to just try it on a baby first before we try it on an animal. And there's other things such as isolation. We can't isolate a baby from its parents to see what that causes in a child. Or we can't do gene knockout studies where we get rid of a gene or part of a brain to find out what the effect is. We can't do that on a human. It's just not ethical. And then we have to respect the rights of psychotherapy clients. I'm not really sure why it talks about psychotherapy in this section because um, it doesn't really have anything to do with research, but when we talk about respecting the rights of psychotherapy clients, all information must be confidential. So a therapist cannot go and talk about um, their client with anybody else. If they do so, a records release has to be signed. So the patient has to sign and say, yes, you can talk to this person about it. But there's a couple of different instances where they can break confidentiality. One, if the person is harming somebody else. Two, if the person is going to harm themselves. And three, if somebody is harming the participant. Those are the three ways when clients can break that confidentiality. Okay, we're going to watch three videos and then talk about the ethics of them. Good grammar and spelling are important, but if you want to write essays that inspire, message. John B. Watson, known for establishing the behavior school of psychology, carried out one of the most influential psychology studies in the 1920s that would later on be something that would never be forgotten. Classical conditioning first experimented by Ivan Pavlov, was used on a dog when an unconditional stimulus was used to produce an unconditional response, and a conditioned stimulus was used to produce a conditioned response. This was later on extended by Watson in his demonstration of the Little Albert experiment. In Watson's experiment, a little baby Albert was used to be conditioned. He was born to a woman was a nurse in the Harriet Lane home of Invalid Children. Although raised in a hospital environment, Albert developed normally and was very stable. Ivan Pavlov was indeed able to condition the dog. Could Watson now do the same thing in humans? Now to the actual experiment itself. First off, Watson presented little Albert objects that he was not afraid of. Objects that Albert initially liked. These included fire. Who lets a baby play with fire? A monkey. Dog. 
rapid. Finally, a white rat. Albert in particular likes the white rat. From all these clips, notice Albert's positive reaction. Now comes the condition. To start off the condition, when Albert reached to touch the rat, a loud bar was struck whenever Albert reached for the rat. Here, Albert first off fell forward and was startled, but he did not cry. But he reached for it for a second time and heard it, and then he started to cry. Watson had indeed conditioned a fear response in little Albert. Albert was then shown a rabbit. He immediately cried and got as far away as possible from him. Then a dog was also crying. Albert did not cry right away. He was acting cautious, and it was only when the dog came right up to his head that he began to cry and tried to get away. After this, a sealed fur coat was brought in. Albert turned away from it and was agitated. Then Watson used the Santa Claus mask. Is that not the creepiest Santa you've ever seen? Which provoked a more negative response from the Albert. From the previous experience from the white rat, little Albert suddenly became afraid of familiar objects that had the same characteristics as the white rat. This phenomenon was known as generalization. Watson then wanted to test whether the reaction would carry over in a different setting. The previous tests were done in a small dark room, but now he was brought into a larger room. He was presented with the same objects but did not show strong symptoms of withdrawal until the objects were paired with a loud noise. Watson now wanted to see if fear could remain in Albert over a period of time. So Albert was brought home and returned in one month. When he returned, he was tested with the same objects and paired with the same loud noises. Albert indeed showed the same strong sign of withdrawal. Watson once again proved that he could condition fear into baby Albert. Watson concluded that phobias were most likely conditioned responses. The Little Albert study is extremely important in psychology and other disciplines. It has inspired other important researchers of the past and continues to impact the direction of the psychological investigation today. Opponent process theory tells you about it. Okay, so not very ethical. You can't condition fear into somebody. It's just not something you should do. So stories are conflicting whether or not they counter conditioned little Albert to not fear anything that was white and furry. Um, regardless of how ethical it is. This was important though, because it did show that you could condition an emotional response. Okay, let's look at our next one. A decade earlier, psychologist Stanley Milgram had also looked at how we respond to authority. In order to understand how people were induced to obey unjust regimes and participate in atrocities such as the Holocaust, he set up an experiment. Volunteers were told they were taking part in scientific research to improve memory. Separated by a screen, the teacher would ask the learner questions in a word game and administer an electric shock when the answer was incorrect. He was told to increase the voltage with each wrong answer. Cloud, horse, rock, house. Answer. Thank you. 
academy requires you to continue teaching. Please continue. Participants didn't know that the learner was really an actor. And the so-called sharks harmed. You're going to get a shot. 180 volts. So as you can see, that one is also not very ethical. People thought that they were killing people. But it's also horrifying that two thirds of people, 66% of people were willing to administer a lethal shock just because somebody in a white coat told them that they needed to. So I don't know if, if they debriefed them after to let them know that they didn't kill anybody. But either way, that's doing some emotional harm because they think that they actually were willing to kill somebody even though they didn't kill somebody. Okay, and then here's our last video that we're gonna watch. summer's day back in 1971 when college students grew their hair long protested against their government and were pro peace and totally anti-authority or so we thought until philip zimbardo so the sample prison study very simply is an attempt to see what happens when you put really good people in a bad place. We put an ad in the city newspaper, wanted students for study of prison life, lasting up to two weeks, and pay you $15 back in 1971 is pretty good money. And we picked 75 volunteers, gave them a battery of psychological tests, and we picked two dozen who in all dimensions were normal and healthy to begin with. And then we did what is critical for all research. We randomly assigned half of them to the role of playing guards or the role of playing prisoners. It's a, literally like flipping the coin. And then what we did is we told the guards to come down a day early and we had them pick their own uniform. We had them help set up the prison so they'd feel like it was their prison and the, and the prisoners were coming into their place. The prisoners, we simply said, wait at home in the dormitories. Well, what we didn't tell them, which is a little bit of the deception of omission, is that they were arrested by the city police. Right there, they, you know, they took me out the door, they put my hands against the um, car. It was a real cop car, it was a real policeman. They took me to the, to the police station, the basement of the police station. Uh, I had told the policeman to put a blindfold on the prisoners. And since they had never been arrested, they didn't know that this had happened. The reason for the blindfold is that my assistants would come, put him in our car, bring him down to our prison, and they'd be in our prison now, blindfolded, guards would strip them naked, uh, de-louse them, pretending that they were lice. It's kind of a degradation control. And after the first day, I was about to end it because nothing was happening. But the next day, on the morning of the next day, the prisoners rebelled. And what the guards did, they came to me and said, prison rebelling, what are we going to do? I said, you're a prisoner. Whatever you want, I will do it, but you better tell me. They said, you have to treat force with force. And they broke down the doors. Stripped the prisoners naked, dragged them out, 
some of them, they tied up their feet, they put them in solitary confinement, which is a tiny little hole uh, in the closet, uh, about, about this big, uh, dark, uh, and, and they said, at this point, everything but breathing air is a privilege. Food is a privilege, clothes are a privilege, having a bed is a privilege. So the guards begin to say, here are the new rules. And the new rules are, you are dangerous, and we are going to treat you as such. And then began to escalate. Each day, the level of uh, abuse, aggression, violence against prisoners is more and more extreme. And so the guards change and become more dominant. And you see, it's all about power, the whole institution. that empowers the guards, who are the representative of this institution or prison, to do whatever is necessary to prevent prisoners from escaping, maintaining law and order. research demonstrates so dramatically is that situations can affect us more than we think and can often outweigh individual characteristics. So if we're going to use psychology to try to reduce the possibility for evil, maybe we need to focus more on systems and less on individuals. But should the research ever have been done? After all, the participants suffered real harm. In hindsight, again, I have mixed feelings about the study should have been done well not if it means suffering of anybody. Would I like my son to have been in that study? No. On the other hand, does it tell us something vital about human nature that has enduring value? And there I have to say yes. Uh, it's been used in lots of prisons. It's a training device to get people to be sensitized to how easy it is to abuse power. Uh, so in that sense, it has, has widespread enduring value. Therefore, I'm saying, well, I'm, I'm glad I did it.
Okay, again, not very ethical. People were actually harmed both emotionally and physically in this experiment. So all three of these experiments are not very ethical, but they're key in psychology because we learned a lot from these. They would never be approved today, but it's vital that they were carried out previously because it gives us a lot of information on human nature. So that's all for today. I'll see you guys next week.